Hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to our webinar on women leading change in social impact. We are just going to wait a few seconds to allow everybody to log on before we start this engaging and fun, warm session today. Hello. Hello to all joining us from around the globe today. We're going to have a fantastic team behind the scenes helping us out and a great panel. So just a little bit longer and then I will start. All right, well, again, hello to all joining us from around the globe today. Thank you. I know many of you come from our Wilma community. And for those who are joining us for the first time, welcome. To find out more about Wilma, I have a QR code on the screen for you to scan. And of course, there is a team working with me today who will put details in the chat throughout our session. They will shed light on Wilma's work and our values. But we do have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm going to get straight into it. To ask questions is already half the solution of a problem. I would say this has been the theme of our webinar series. It applied to our first with Catherine Bishop in Map Your Success. It certainly resonated in our second with Paul Fisher in Nail Your Negotiations. And here today in our final webinar with Gail Peterson, Women Leading Change in Social Impact seems apt to discover the questions we ask ourselves and of others. Some of us want to have leadership in our lives or to be the leader we wish we had. And in my two plus decades in the workforce, in various sectors, with many interesting stories about leadership, my own, the ones I have witnessed and the ones I have and will continue to question. We all want to know what leadership looks like. Leadership is a wonderful responsibility and it is not about the title you hold. It can be about the outcomes and opportunities you can give someone. The effect and value you can attach to each interaction it has taken me a long time to accept any compliments about my work, leadership style or impact. And I developed Wilma from my true belief that women in leadership must shift the divide to conquer narrative to one of diversity, equality and inclusion. To make room and to pay it forward. I really did not expect the ripple effect that has happened over the last 12 months. And to be speaking with trailblazers from around the globe, to work with leading practitioners in the field of social impact, and to receive support and encouragement to continue my work in the field of leadership and impact. It has been empowering. And I know you are all here today because you deeply care about making an impact. What will you do with your power? Now, I have had the pleasure of working with Gail Peterson throughout 2021. I have learned a lot and I have laughed a lot and it gives me great pleasure to have her close out this series. Gail is an Associate Fellow at Syed Business School and the Program Director of Impact Investing and Social Finance. And also joining us on the panel today is Sandrine Henton, Managing Director at EG Capital and Jackie Copeland, Founder of The Wise Fund both alums of Syed Business School Impact Programs who will most certainly inspire you as they have me. Now I want to ensure we don't miss a minute of their stories and I leave plenty of time for Q&A. So please Gail, would you kindly kick off our session on women leading change in social impact? Thank you, Leila, it's a pleasure to be here. And I'm going to share my screen and we can get started. It's, it's, a, um, it's an amazing time, I think, that, uh, and, and a great opportunity for me to be here today. We're, um, last year, we celebrated 
100 years of women being allowed to receive degrees at Oxford University. I think it's really important for everyone to understand that Oxford is actually 1100 years old. So um, we have to put that in the context of, of that celebration, 1100 years of education and 100 years of allowing women to receive degrees. We're also celebrating 25 years of the Site Business School and celebrating 10 years of our impact investing program. And, um, and I, wanna, I wanna quote one of our colleagues from SBS, a dear friend and um, former housemate actually, who's a senior management fellow, practice fellow at Saeed, uh, Trudy Lang, um, celebrating pioneers of the past and innovators of the future. And that's really what we are about um, in the impact portfolio both men and women in the context of our work, um, and we're gonna have a lot of animation so uh, slides. Um, Sandrine was part of our very first cohort and, and Jackie attended our social finance course last year. So you've got, uh, between the two of them are, represent our 10 year um, journey together. They were chosen for a reason. Um, I, I know them well, I've watched them grow and transition. And I know that they'll speak honestly and openly about challenges and excitement for the future as innovators. So they are colleagues, friends, and part of this incredible community as we celebrate our pioneers and our innovators. Um, and that's what this field has been as we've been launching impact investing globally. And it's been a remarkable experience. And, and not just our alums, which are remarkable, but also the, the colleagues with whom we work like Layla and Annabelle and uh, everyone who's part of our team. Um, we, I think it's important to understand again, the women leading change by the numbers. We've through our programs and actually impact investing spawned three new programs, social finance, impact measurement, and innovative finance. Um, and, and it allows us to grow and change based on the needs of our colleagues. Um, 370 women representing 75 countries and working uh, countries of 70 plus. Um, they work across multiple sectors and represent impact across the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. Many of the colleagues who come to our class, 75% are from finance and most are looking for a new journey, trying to combine their skills and their expertise in finance with passion for change. And I think that Sandrine and Jackie represent that um, and, and many of our other colleagues. And I know there are many alums on this uh, during this session, which is fabulous. It's great to see them. And um, I wanna make sure too, that we understand as a community, um, the importance of pay, paying it forward, uh, making sure that women of privilege um, help those, those women most in need. COVID has done crazy things to the world, as we all know, as we're living in Zoom land, and I haven't been to Oxford for a long time, so I'm going to be there soon, I hope. But again, what's happened is that women are, um, violence against women is increasing, um, uh, child marriage is increasing, all the things that are the, the, the downside of, of women's equity have been diminished and, and hurt during COVID. And so we have an even greater opportunity and an importance to drive us forward to improve the lives of women and girls, women and children, the most vulnerable in our society. And I, I, you know, I, I ask you um, as a provocation, what is our role as women of privilege to help others, both within our, our family, within our organizations, within our community? What is our role and how important is it for us to be involved in helping other people? So it's, it's important to put that context. In our social finance program and, and in our impact investing program in particular, we talk about deliberate leaders. And, and those characteristics that are most important in leadership, courage, collaboration, community, creativity, candor, capital, and compassion, those are winning the day as women leaders take charge in COVID. 
And I think it's really important and, I'll, and, and we'll be providing resources and research. Um, Annabelle will be reaching out to you for those who are interested in, in how women leaders are advancing using what are considered soft skills, but critically important, empathy, ability to create team, ability to be candid about what's not working and adapt as needed. Being resilient leaders requires collaboration in very different ways and being courageous. And those are skill sets that women have. And I think it's important to embrace that and celebrate it. So, um, it, and it's not diminishing power, it's actually enhancing power. We're dealing with the most complex crisis in the world. And when we think about the systems that we have to confront, not only economic power, but tied to environmental security from climate change, education, food security, politics. And again, Sandrine and Jackie have interacted and recognized that system and how you operate as a woman leader in impact, in social impact is critically important that we see the big picture that we understand our role that we need to play to ensure human security for women and children at the centers is critically important. And that's what we emphasize in our social finance and our impact investing program. Again, when we think about UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, our students work across these 17, often pulling together and knitting together the system in which they operate, gender, education, health, hunger, poverty, climate change, all those pieces cannot be pulled apart, but actually seen as a whole. And the systems change that's needed by using finance for impact is critically important. We think about the stage of development, and this is, a, this is actually a, a piece that we use and you spin it around um, and you can see how money is used early stage. Um, late stage, medium, if it's philanthropic resources, if it's impact investing, uh, ESG investing, all those pieces come into play in that system of change at the center trying to improve the lives of women and children. I'm gonna turn it over to um, Sandrine uh, to talk about her journey, but I'm gonna start with tell you a story when, I, when she was in our very first cohort and I remember distinctly being in a lecture hall and asking students to come talk about who influenced their lives. How did they start their journey? And Sandrine uh, boldly came up and talked about her grandmother shaping her values, shaping who she is and shaping her journey. And it's quite been quite a journey. Um, and I, I, would, I, I know that Sandrine would say, I never thought it would take me here. And, and she's gonna talk about her journey, her challenges and some suggestions for you. So Sandrine, I'm gonna turn it over to you and let me know when you want me to shift slides. Thank you, Gail. And uh, it's amazing to be together. It's a blast from the past 10 years. It has gone uh, really too quickly. And uh, thank you, Leila, also for bringing this community uh, together. I think we need more of that, especially uh, now during the pandemic. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about who we are today, what I do today. Um, but the focus of the conversation is really going to be around um, women uh, in the investment management uh, world uh, in my little bubble uh, and uh, lessons learned what not to do uh, from me and uh, how you can get there uh, faster and, uh, and better. Um, so we created uh, EG Capital uh, uh, to invest in the potential of youth and women in East Africa. Um, and we're managing an impact investment firm. We have three offices uh, over Kenya, Uganda, and Zambia. Um, and this is our journey. You can see it's very uh, presented very linear. This is what we show to our investors with uh, milestones achieved um, every year. Um, and it did start with a very humble uh, grassroots uh, grant, uh, uh, research grant with DFID and Oxford Policy Management to look at the links between uh, food health education sector and improving the life chances of young people. Um, and every step of the way, we had some little milestones and, and some little support um, to effectively be in a position today where we're um, 
uh, in the process of closing our first investment fund and have built a team together. Um, so as you can see, it takes time. <laughs> and so we had our, our first investor during the pandemic in December 2022 um, committing to, uh, to the fund. Um, so perhaps we can move very quickly to the next uh, slide, um, which is, you know, my own journey and obviously it's not uh, it's not linear <laughs> and and I think um, it started really uh, let's go back uh, in the past uh, um, I was a first generation learner uh, in my family with an incredible grandmother and uh, a mom who um, did not go beyond primary school uh, but they were incredible entrepreneurs and that shaped my role models at home in, in a familiar environment where I saw women really taking the lead. Uh, but then of course at university, it, it's not the same. <laughs> so this is what um, we don't talk about and what you don't see on the, on the investor presentation, but it's equally important to sort of um, uh, talk about our own journey. What do we do the things that we do every day? Uh, and to demystify a little bit uh, women in the investment management industry. Um, so I was a first generation learner and I remember graduation was uh, really what I had not planned for <laughs> and, and what to do after graduation. And um, it's interesting um, when you have not necessarily uh, role models uh, uh, in your family, uh, what do you decide to do and how do you base your self-esteem on, etc. And I remember quite clearly my self-esteem was simply based on all right, who is on campus? What are the most difficult top companies to work for? <laughs> and if I didn't get that, I know I wouldn't be happy with myself. Um, so obviously I went into banking and into strategy consulting for the early years uh, of my work experiences. And I learned great analytical skills. Uh, however, I would say there was always uh, um, uh, these projects I was doing outside of work. So I was helping uh, an entrepreneur in Kenya. I was helping a friend set up a charity in India. Um, I wrote my thesis on uh, ESG at the time. It was a long time ago. Uh, ratings of company based on ESG uh, criteria. But it's not was what I was able to do day to day. So I think as many uh, many millennials <laughs> would, uh, would recognize, I think uh, a good financial crisis in 2018 uh, and now a pandemic today really helps you, uh, you know, get out of your comfort zone and, uh, and think differently about what you do and how you spend your time. Um, and for me, it was really sort of daring um, to do things uh, for me and not based on uh, what society, what your parents, uh, what others expect you to do. Um, I think whatever background we come from, I think these are good questions to ask ourselves uh, um, to really find out what really motivates and drives you. And so that was a brilliant time uh, for these type of, of reflections. And, and I wish universities, uh, when we talked about Oxford and, and Saeed, were actually preparing their students for that type of questions um, as opposed to who is recruiting on campus and, and everybody sort of being um, in a way um, conditioned to follow a certain mold and a certain career path because there's so many ways to contribute positively to the world and to all of the challenges and the problems uh, that, that we all encounter. So for me it was a time to really uh, align my work with personal values and I wanted a problem to solve. So I didn't want to do more of the corporate finance projects that started to look the same one after the other um, and I wanted to dedicate uh, you know my, my 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 abilities to solving a certain problem and obviously uh, that was for me the education the youth aspect and, and sort of looking at developing countries because I saw that developing countries were experiencing exactly what we've experienced in Europe um, so Gail talked about my grandmother we were from from Portugal under dictatorship and my grandparents uh, fled to France uh, with their young kids that were seven years old. We didn't go to finish uh, high school, uh, primary school because they had to go and work. So uh, we did have that in Europe, <laughs> only one or two generations, uh, two generations ago. And I think that uh, for me, that was really a motivator to uh, look at emerging markets that are going through uh, similar changes, uh, getting their young people educated and leading productive lives. 
uh, we're looking by 2030 at 1.4 um, children that will not go beyond the first year of secondary school in low and middle income countries, according to the UN uh, Education Commission. So this is at least for me uh, the big problem that I was really passionate uh, uh, to, to, to have a, a way to dedicate uh, my professional life uh, to this issue. So what do you do? I had a, a little inspiration, a mentor, and I also took the class uh, at, uh, at Said, uh, the Oxford um, Impact Investing course. You can guess which one. Um, and for me, this was a seed because in that classroom, there were actually many women and they were all doing something that I would never imagine was even possible. <laughs> so for me, that created uh, a sense of um, opportunity, a community, uh, to know that it's actually possible to do this type of work really opened uh, a lot of possibilities and uh, I embraced that. I had an amazing mentor also at the time. It was all about chaos theory and design thinking. So I decided to take a plunge and, and to do it and to start something um, from scratch. It was really by, by choice. Um, and it took a really long time, it was a long journey. <laughs> um, and every year I would take stock uh, of what I'd learned, what I've achieved. I looked around me and I saw always amazing people I was working with that were really willing to be patient with me. <laughs> um, and, and to take, you know, take me along a very interesting growth path. And I decided to invest another year and persevered. Um, in 2018, I would say the ecosystem for women who wanted to manage capital, women who wanted to become investment managers, really changed. I mean, we're in a world where 99% of the trillions are managed by a white male, uh, still. And the finance industry is, is perhaps one of those industries uh, where women still have to uh, make a lot of progress in, in have equal opportunity. Um, so the G7 has put an ecosystem in place uh, to support women-led fund managers uh, to access uh, capital. Um, and, and we've been able to, as I said before, uh, get our first investor during the pandemic. And uh, we've built a very strong team that 65% uh, women-owned and equal participation of women uh, at all levels, the IC, uh, the board and, and the team. Um, so that's a little bit about my, my journey, uh, which has been very long. I decided to do and to build everything from scratch. And it's been a personal journey as well, because me 10 years ago would not be able to do the things that we are doing right now in my team. So it's, um, it is possible. And, and that's something I want to, to pass on to for people to say that if you start a career in development, if you start a career as an in NGO, um, you can learn, you can move across different sectors and you can adapt your skill set. And there shouldn't be really a, that much of a hurdle. Um, the next slide, uh, I'll go quickly. Um, so the issues facing women fund managers and really my, my call for action for this discussion today together uh, is that you can get there quicker and just as well. Um, of course, we all know the issues. Um, we're over-mentored and undercapitalized. Um, there's often a lack of role models. So how do young girls finishing high school or finishing university uh, do even know that this type of professions is available and accessible to them. Um, and also this transition of very experienced women that are accountants, uh, auditors, and corporate financiers would make actually really great fund managers. And, you know, there's also this lack of succession plan, very large and very established asset managers uh, typically don't have succession plans in place that involve the enough uh, diversity uh, and equality. So you really do end up uh, across fund one, fund two, fund three to see the same partners and the same male partners. Um, and investors, um, you know, do start to recognize nowadays um, the potential to invest in diverse teams that usually perform better, um, but there's still some unconscious bias in women accessing capital. And the statistics do tell us uh, women-led fund managers that typically uh, are raising between 2.5 and 5 million when they actually they need a hundred or more. Um, so these statistics uh, still need to change. And there's been really a, an incredible ecosystem that's been put um, together 
um, I would um, encourage anybody that wants to look at these type of uh, careers to look at the 2x Ignite uh, community, um, to look at fund administrators and lawyers like IQEQ and Hogan Levels, um, because there's definitely a community of purpose and impact that's been now designed as an ecosystem to really launch pad and bring more women uh, in charge of capital. I think it's a, a really interesting moment in, in history um, where, where women have access to capital and we're starting to, to take it. And it's been amazing for me to see um, many young women actually a lot more purposeful. It doesn't take them 10 years to find out what it is that they want to do. Um, and and um, they have a lot more resources uh, available. So um, yeah, that's it for me. Thank you, Sandrine. Thank you, Sandrine. And uh, Jackie, over to you. Okay, well, I first wanna say good day to all time zones. And I'm really delighted to be a part of this conversation. I wanna thank my friend Gail in particular, uh, Layla and the entire Oxford Impact team. And Sandrine, thanks for sharing your inspiring story. There are so many unexpected parallels, and I'll look forward to talking to you about them at another point. Also, a happy 10th year anniversary. Your work really is changing the world for good every day, and that's not an easy feat, so I want to recognize that. In a few months, I will be celebrating my 60th birthday and my 40th year in the global social change and impact field. So this is a really ideal opportunity for me to look back. It's been on my mind anyway. I've worked in many different countries and types of organizations worldwide. It has been uh, quite a journey and I will do my best to compress the journey into the seven to 10 minutes we have today. Uh, for starters, I think it's important to reference our origin stories, which I, I believe start us on our change-making journeys. Uh, I was born in the 1960s, and um, I think my evolution as a change-maker was in some ways predestined. I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, in the USA. Uh, to a mother who, who had escaped the Jim Crow South with my extended maternal family. And as the eldest born into the height of the American Civil Rights Movement, I was told since I could remember that I was quote, a child of the dream. And that was a heavy responsibility because it meant that it was my blessing and responsibility to build ladders of opportunity for others, that I was expected to be excellent, I was supposed to lift as I climbed, and that my family and my ancestors' ability to survive the history of Black people and women in particular meant that I should want to dream in a limitless way, that I could actually do anything, and that my life needed to be about paying it forward, loving humanity and helping other people achieve their full potential so that they would not need to suffer uh, some of the oppression that was overcome and part of my family's experience. Now also, although my family for various reasons didn't have access to higher education in the Southern US um, during their prime, they had absolutely unshakable values that allowed them to survive the worst of human behavior in history with joy, absolutely unshakable determination of faith in their their children's future, hope, bravery, resilience, actually all of the elements of adaptive leadership uh, that are necessary for success and making change real against some serious odds. So this or early orientation gave me permission 
uh, to dream really big. Um, and the other thing my mother did in the, in the midst of sometimes racial and sexist uh, hazing, her approach was, um, she would say to me, uh, remember that you're a child of God and everyone else is, but doesn't necessarily know it. And to me, that was just a radical concept. It was like a shield of armor kind of walking through the world in some highly discriminatory um, practice, um, context. Um, even to this day, uh, I think, well, you know, I have a right to be here. I'll walk in any room um, I think I need to be in and just treat everyone else as human beings and ultimately it will work out. So the challenge that I think we often face as women change makers is having that commitment to change making does not exempt us from our family and community care responsibilities and figuring out how to integrate both sides of our lives has been a huge challenge for me as a woman but certainly not unique to me and other women have been key to helping me get through those phases of life. Um, I was under the impression, and this was part of my family's um, ethic, that education was my ticket to achieving my big world-changing dreams. Um, and I was taught, as uh, many marginalized people are, that I would need at least quadruple the training and credentials to be credible. Uh, one huge racist, uh, huge lesson learned was that in a sexist and racist world, credentials and deep experience are not necessarily enough as they will often be discounted. However, um, the values that my family imparted to me, uh, unshakable faith in one's place in the world, allies of all backgrounds, um, very avid network and community building, multiple sources of income, including a personal legal defense fund that could be activated when needed, are all among some of the necessary um, safety nets that one needs to create in navigating the realities of a world that may not always see your value. Um, from the 1990s through now, I've worked as an executive in technology, philanthropy, and now impact investing. And that is rooted in my childhood too. I had these huge dreams as a young woman, but the big question was for coming from a family with a very humble background, how do you finance it? And I'll never forget the eldest cousin, the only cousin who actually lived in the Southern US told me about scholarships. And I remember saying to her, you mean these are strangers who will believe in me and will just give me money that I don't have to pay back so I can go to college if I get AIDS. And after I learned that, <laughs> it was like, okay, I can get some AIDS and I can get some money. And that was probably my genesis as a, as a, um, a fundraiser, essentially. Um, that uh, making change real required money. And then I needed to figure out how to build alliances with people who had access to financial resources. And I built upon that early experience of needing to struggle to finance uh, my education and learn how to write grant applications and create proposals for other types of funding and um, built that essentially into a career. Another key lesson learned, hard lesson, is that all women leaders, I think all leaders, but particularly women, because we have as change makers, these intense uh, commitments to making the world better. And at the same time, these family and community responsibilities and I um, have come up with, it's almost a, a strategic and programmatic approach 
um, that I use in working with women that focuses on wellness, how to be well while doing good, uh, personally, um, in, in, as well as in our global work. Uh, today, with the Women Invested to Save Earth Fund, um, which is only two, uh, about two and a half years old, um, like many people, I'd, I wouldn't say I had an existential crisis, but as a change maker, you're constantly evaluating yourself, asking the question, am I doing enough good? Am I making enough impact? And in uh, the summer of 2019, I had my first assignment um, in Australia and was really struck with the country. It was a transformative experience. And then one day after I returned um, back to Silicon Valley from Australia, it seemed as if the entire country was burning. I'm sure you remember. Um, it was called the Black Summer. And soon after that, returning to the US, you will remember that it was clear that COVID was a global phenomenon. Um, it was hitting um, communities of color in the US uh, particularly hard. And regardless of income or privilege in life, it is quite a transformative experience um, to suddenly find family members dying in large numbers with this mysterious disease that our leaders did not quite fully understand. And um, at the same time in California, California was literally burning. And of course, there were the very public murders of people like George Floyd, Ahmaud uh, Arbery. So it, there was this moment where climate change, um, anti-Black racism, um, and also uh, COVID, the COVID pandemic, which is in itself an environmental disease in many ways, were all converging into a massive crisis that was in the living room of every person on the plant, planet and hitting disadvantaged communities at all levels, particularly hard. I left the tech comp company uh, that I was working with and decided to create the Women Invested to Save Earth Fund as a uh, way to create more financing for women and people of color who only receive 1% or less of venture funding, um, about 8% or less of philanthropic funding, and really try to apply my background in technology as well as um, cross-sector funding into a gender <clears throat> and racial equity-based fund. The idea being that if we have more than half the planet who cannot get the access to capital to address the very real challenges facing our world and all people, it is unlikely that we will be able to achieve the SDGs and um, save our communities literally. Um, it was, it's also an umbrella organization for two movements. I've been privileged to lead and uh, found in my career, one called uh, Black Philanthropy Month, which is a global funding equity uh, movement uh, created 10 years ago that has now reached almost 20 million people in 60 um, countries and has created 10 intersectional funding equity principles and an associated pledge uh, to help companies that are and um, financing institutions that are serious about, um, about funding equity. And we're creating a global funding equity uh, index that can be uh, adapted at various local 
national, regional, <clears throat> and global scales. The idea being that one of the reasons there's this persistent challenge with funding equity and that economic justice is the last frontier of various liberation movements is because we do not have any composite indicator uh, to measure and hold financing institutions accountable um, for equity. Um, I have in the period, especially during COVID, um, as a result of COVID refined my life mission to be healing people, society, economies, and the planet that we share. And really focusing on the next generation sharing whatever access to intellectual, financial, social wellness capital that I have um, as the next generation will need a lot of support in addressing this mixed legacy at best that we are leaving with them. Um, so in, in closing, I would say that my thinking today is that radical self-love, women learning how to take care of themselves as well as they take care of others is absolutely key. Uh, women um, of color tend to have, um, grow up in cultures with what I call super women complexes, where often we are trained that an indicator of how well we're doing change, change making is how much of our own time we're sacrificing. And that results in health and wellness disparities. Um, living um, a lifestyle of love for humanity, the most expansive meaning of philanthropy, em empathy, courage, authenticity, mutually supportive community building, a commitment to wellness, and an unshakable faith in a better future, remembering that even in times of crisis and hyper change, a better future for all is possible and in our hands, especially in the hands of women today. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. That was lovely and wonderful. And I think we're over to um, reflections and questions. I, um, what I also will do is there's a remarkable amount of work that's going on in terms of impact investing and gender lens investing and um, you know, livable uh, uh, wage and uh, livable uh, um, action for women and equity. So I will send you resources and have those posted um, online. Uh, uh, Annabelle will help do that. Um, so with that, let's, let's, let's have a conversation. Um, this again is, is a representative of our community and, um, and we, we become allies and mentors by getting to know our stories. And, and with that, I'm going to open it up to conversations um, and chats. Uh, Layla and Annabelle, do you want to guide us through any questions that have come up? Sorry, Gail, just unmuting. Uh, before we, we, we delve into questions, I just wanted to highlight the extraordinary stories of, of Jackie and Sandrine. And there's been some fantastic um, chat happening there in terms of engagement and people pointing out the effect that those stories had on them. And those are the stories that I feel are just so important for us to keep having, to know what work is happening in this space led by women and what they've gone through. Um, I would love to hear more from, from Jackie and Sandrine in terms of um, any specific obstacles uh, when not only starting out, but even now as they're well into the game. Um, I think that would be great uh, to talk about some of the lessons learned um, in the industry specifically, while we do have some more um, questions coming through on the chat. Um, either Jackie or Sandrine, jump in. Well, I, I can I can start and I'll, I'll just be brief. Um, I mean, at this issue of inequitable access to capital is real for us in funding and our own institutions. It struck me when Sandrine talked about the time it took 10 years. Um, I often, because I've had this now experience of living in Silicon Valley for 14 years, 
Um, men don't necessarily have, and I'm not saying just walking in a room and being the man means you get funding, but I have seen so many instances where there were men, mostly white men, who could get funding for just truly half-baked ideas. Um, and women and others who just don't fit the prototypes there are not just implicit biases in funding, there are actual theories. Like one is that the best, um, the best chance of investing in a company that will become a unicorn is if the entrepreneur is in his or her 20s. Now, for, for me, that is such an ageist, obviously ageist concept but there are fun funders and investors in Silicon Valley and there are books written about that where that has been presented as a social fact and any good funder would be investing their money in 20 something year olds. And so navigating all of these implicit biases, um, you know, another one is that women and people of color don't have the skills and there's a pipeline issue, empirically untrue, but it is a very strong belief that impacts access to capital and therefore the socioeconomic status of our community. So that's the key one. And then the other one that I mentioned is um, navigating and balancing family and professional responsibilities, because as has been highlighted in COVID, um, women across most cultures have a very, um, have more responsibility for family intimate care. And um, so navigating those two dimensions of both personal life and let's just say systemic life as a change maker in the impact and finance field are realities at, and in different ways for most women I have encountered across the world and why targeted funds like mine and Sadrine's are still needed. I look forward to a day where there's a level playing field and we don't need special mechanisms to get equity for women and other marginalized people, but that will not happen in my lifetime, although I will continue working on it to do my part. Sandrine. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I think challenges, they're, they're definitely always there. What I've learned to differentiate is um, knowing what your your goal is like setting like uh, little achievable goals uh, and then understanding also the areas uh, where you're stuck so stacks always happen uh, but they're temporary when you get stuck with a certain challenge it is temporary and you can talk to others and you can um, open up certain questions like how would you think about this issue how would you do it differently than I am doing um, and how can I help you uh, so that you make it also mutual it's not just what you get uh, there are some of these powerful questions that I found uh, really interesting whenever there are challenges I think more systemic challenges uh, in in our industry uh, Jacqueline already mentioned them but I would also say say uh, the next generation for sure. Um, raising funds as a woman is difficult. Raising funds in, in Africa when you're in an emerging market is even more difficult. Um, and when you focus on the social sectors like food, health and education, education, which is less than 2% of capital in the world and less than 2% of foreign aid, you're in it for all of the challenges you can think of. Um, but I would say like for me, it's the next generation to really see um, next gen fund managers. And I've built my team yes, as a local yeah. team in Kenya. And I think uh, sometimes you just don't wait until the change happens. You just make it happen. And we change the incentives. So basically, uh, uh, carried interest, equity ownership of the company is accessible at all levels, from analysts to directors, including support functions. And if you're a junior partner in fund one, you will become a partner in fund two. 
Um, and this is where I see a great potential for women that have done like auditing, accounting, corporate finance to kind of move into fund one and prove their track record, do their first investment, and then take a leadership journey to be a full partner in fund two. And there's such an amazing talent um, where we are in, in East Africa. Um, and um, it's incredible skills that these women bring to the table. And I'm really excited about sort of building that in um, how we work to make sure that we just have more women fund managers and also uh, women at university, so internships. So again, offering internships, uh, especially if you work in emerging markets where 70% of the youth is unemployed, uh, when you offer an internship opportunity, suddenly it's a springboard to a job. And I think during COVID, we can all do something about that. It's within what we all can uh, control. Um, and offering young women uh, role models and career path that they would not have seen uh, otherwise, and definitely a lot of job opportunities as well. So that's sort of the, the bigger challenges that we try to be a little bit conscious about. <laughs> yeah, and I, the one thing that I would also say is that Sidrine and I are part of a broader movement of ex an explosion of women-led funds, um, different types of capital uh, funds, all of them built around this ethic of just extending that ladder of opportunity as 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 long as we can um, possibly. So there, there is great hope and opportunity despite the obstacles. It, however, requires us to envision a different way of doing business and to create these mechanisms ourselves. They're always, even in the midst of um, discrimination and challenges, allies and opportunities. I, I say that because there is a level of massive despair sometimes um, especially during this COVID era, but uh, very encouraging to see all of the entrepreneurial energy of women and people of color and others uh, across the world uh, to create a more equitable economy to literally save the planet. And, and I think Jackie and Sandrine um, and, and our colleagues who are joining us today um, some lessons learned from the classroom and, I, and they embody when we're in an Oxford classroom or virtually the relationships that you need to build to push the limit right. of, of who is in the room with you that you may not talk to. And mm -hmm. I often, when we're in Oxford, um, colleagues who are not in finance moving into impact investing, there's an intimidation, often an intimidation. I don't know the numbers. I'm anxious about that. I don't have anything to say. That attitude, and I'll remember a colleague from Australia who was raising $60 million annually for the work that she was doing. Virtually all of our students wanna create funds, $20 million funds. Here is a woman who has did that every year for 10 years and was afraid to say something because she didn't speak the language of finance. Um, mm. And we broke through because often we pull together those women who feel uncomfortable they're not from financial backgrounds to talk about their assets. And as you're in the classroom and you're thinking about deal making, think about the colleagues from the NGO community. Think about the colleagues from academia. Think about the colleagues from finance. Look at those um, non-traditional backgrounds and recognize the power that they bring in a collaboration. And that thinking about problem solving differently and team members and the allies that we need to create is so critically important. And that's the powerhouse that will move money, right? It's the, that power of, of belief and collaboration. Um, and that's- exciting. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. So all so about relationships. It's all about relationships. Layla, other questions from colleagues? We do, and we may have run out of time. So I just want everybody to know that if we do run out of time, we will export your questions and we will do a follow-up to make sure that you do get answered. Um, so I'm just gonna read out one here, which I, again, there's lots of comments about all your inspiring stories and the advice that you would give. Um, one from Katerina, I'm just gonna really uh, be quick on this one. What is your single best advice you've got on your journey? And this is to everybody. 
Sandrine and Jackie? Well, I would say what came to mind immediately is you can have it all, but you can't have it all at the same time. So really the importance of being nibble and um, kind of, you know, the, the, ter the word of the century may be pivot. I will say I'm the pivot queen. Uh, I'm the comeback queen. I just, um, I intend to be here as long as I'm supposed to be here. And, you know, uh, adding positivity and change to the planet. Um, and so that advice to sort of, to pace oneself and take care of oneself um, is critical, um, especially in a time of crisis and anxiety like we're living in now, where there's pressure to get it all done, change the world within the next quarter, please. Andrean. Yeah, I would echo that. Uh, rest is the basis of all action. Uh, so uh, knowing when, <laughs> knowing when, when to take a rest uh, and to say stop um, when you're not productive, no point is continuing to sit at, at your desk and uh, just allowing that time for yourself without feeling guilty. Um, and the other aspect is the two questions that I mentioned before. So to, to know um, that I can ask for help. I can ask others to help me solve this. How would you solve that? And how can I help you back? Uh, I think that's, uh, for me, that was an incredible question because I had this tendency uh, that all the problems are on my shoulders and I kept them to myself, which was yes. not the right thing to do. So it's such a liberating question when you just open up to others and say, look, I'm, I'm dealing with this issue. How would you do that? And not, not assume that it's, it's for you to solve everything on your own. <laughs> And I think that that piece of network, the beauty of the community and, and, and the ability to honestly say, I need help because mm -hmm. uh, you've got colleagues. Um, I see Alexandra is, is on. I see our colleagues uh, are, are from other classes are on. This is our community that we draw on. This is mm -hmm. our strength. This is our creativity. And this is our power. Fantastic. Um, we have a question from Paula. Do any books um, inspire you? Can you recommend any? Again, for the whole panel. Well, actually, in September, a book is going to come out, and I, I, it's it's all about this. It's called "Good, Evil, Wicked: The Art, Science, and Business of Impact," and mm. it looks at uh, it's eighteen hundred interviews across twenty countries, looking at how investors are making a difference in the lives of women and children. So that's forthcoming, but we will put together a list of resources. But Jackie and Sandrine, we've all got our own special, what gives us strength and what gives us advice and guidance books. Hmm. Okay, I'll mention one, which is maybe a little unconventional, uh, but if you don't know him, uh, uh, he's been my strength during COVID. Uh, so I'm a little bit of a follower of, uh, of Sadhguru, uh, which is this very funny, uh, modern uh, um, Indian um, that uh, sort of spreads a, a lot of technique for um, inner engineering and well-being uh, because we take care of external appearance every day, uh, but we don't necessarily uh, clean up inside. And it's been really amazing uh, to for me to look at these techniques of meditation, uh, movement, uh, breathing, but also just to keep uh, a lot of mental clarity and, and focus uh, during all of the hardship of uh, COVID. So I'll definitely uh, recommend uh, recommend uh, his book. <laughs> Fantastic. And we'll put together a reading list um, too as part of our 10 year anniversary celebration. Yeah, it's really interesting that you say that, Sadrine, because I found myself recently, um, well, the past two, three years, revisiting the work of Deepak Chopra, um, just because I think so, whatever your spirituality is, whether it involves, quote, God or not, or if you're an atheist, just this whole um, belief in something bigger um, than us uh, is really critical in a time of radical change that's in the process of becoming. And so I found myself looking for that sustenance and grounding uh, more, especially with the out uh, since first quarter 2020, put it that way. I think that's fantastic. And part of it is this idea of um, the celebration 
the joy of connecting the stories and the people that we love and that we care about and the mission that we're on. That is what impact investing is. Impact is first, investing is second. Social finance, social is first. How we make a difference with money. How do we change and create a world that is safe, is healthy, and where we're all uh, at a place of equality. And I think that's the, that's the drive for our courses and it requires your leadership. Um, the leadership to make commitment the leadership to build collaboration and the leadership to show compassion. So Layla, thoughts, Annabelle, yes. thoughts? <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. And I'm not surprised that we are running out of time. Ifra, I saw your fantastic question. We will get that out to you. I know many of you are asking what we're going to do with some of the information and resources. We will be sending follow-up emails to those that have registered and who are those that are subscribed to the Wilma community. So I will go ahead and try and wrap this up because, uh, of course, we could talk all day. It's been a fantastic session. So thank you so much. Um, so please, once again, thank you, Gail, Sandrine, and Jackie. This webinar series with Oxford University Syed Business School has come to an end. However, none of it would have been possible without volunteers, believers, allies, advocates, and many more who I could not fit on the screen today, or enough time to mention them individually. I thank you. Now, you may have heard this before. Surround yourself with people who would mention your name in a room full of opportunities. Here at Wilma, we want to infuse a culture of be that person who mentions other women's names in a room full of opportunities. You have the power to do this. Let's not put up blocks. Let us support each other to reach great heights and know there is room for all of us to make an impact. Let us disrupt systems that have operated unfairly for a long time with not only powerful words, but with actions. We value the work at the Wilma organization and continue to provide not only powerful content and conversations like what we have delivered in our webinar series, but we will move forward on the northbound train to create a space and avenues on a global scale to drive improvements in gender equality and a network of women who you've seen on the screen today, who have spoken today, and allies from around the world who will be your cheerleaders. So what is the best thing we could do after this webinar that doesn't cost a thing and can have an impact? Mention a woman's name in a room full of opportunities and see what happens. Thank you so much to Saeed Business School. Thank you to Gail. Thank you to our speaker, Sandrine, Jackie. It has been a pleasure. Um, and uh, we, we will get to everybody who has put uh, questions into the Q&A box and we will send out some materials as well. So from the bottom of my heart, thank you. Thank you.